Greetings, this is Keith Lewin, Professor of International Development and Education at the University of Sussex. I've been asked to comment on the World Development Report 2018 and I'm very pleased to do so. This is a good report in many ways and contains a vast amount of information and insight into education and development in, 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 from different points of view. I'll leave it to others to comment specifically on the aspects of it which deal with learning because I think for many people the surprise is that there isn't actually more about learning. There's a lot about assessing learning but very little about educational aims, different educational objectives, pedagogy, epistemology and so on. As I say I leave that to others. I think the main point I want to make in this short piece uh, of a reaction to the WDR is some surprise that it doesn't spend more time on financing. If there is a learning crisis, and it's not clear to me that the learning crisis is any worse than it was in the past, indeed I would think that far more children are learning far more than they were in 1990, uh, but that's another kind of question. If there is a learning crisis, it's actually really a financing crisis, and that's particularly true if you address the problem from the point of view of development agencies. The one thing they can do is try and contribute to generating sustainable finance for education much more difficult for them to adapt to the many different and varied education systems around the world, the different ambitions of national political systems and of communities within different cultures who may see the purposes of education in very different ways. Much better to concentrate on what certainly development agencies can do, which is get the financing right, um, and see if that problem can be resolved so that learning can take place. So. That's my main observation and I've got really seven points to make about the financing. The first is that there is an emerging consensus that around about six to seven percent of GDP is needed to finance the goals set by the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, our estimates suggest that those that the GPE have done and the International Finance Commission all point in the same direction. But this would be extremely challenging it would require a very considerable increase in the amount of aid to finance it and the other problem is that this money that would have to be found to reach these levels uh, would have to be recurrent finance. The current average for low income and low middle income countries is a little over 4%, 4.3 perhaps, but that includes existing levels of aid and if you take the aid out of that equation the average is probably closer to 3%. It would require therefore a doubling or tripling of aid and it would have to be for the indefinite future uh, unless or until there is a, some method of financing education systems from domestic revenue. Why not start with that as the problem because that is the problem. So the difficulty with the WDR is there is no real plan B if the kind of money that would need to be raised isn't raised which it won't be then what happens next? Do we continue with a plan that we know will fail for lack of resources, contrary to what was said in Dakar in, 20, and in the year 2000, that no country would fail to achieve its goals in education and development for lack of resources? Well, I think they will, uh, and there will be a lack of resources unless we address the fiscal problems. Second, there is a set of benchmarks around of 6% uh, four to six percent of GDP for education and 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent of the public budget for education. These two put together, of course, arithmetically speaking, would not actually generate six percent of GDP. Uh, the problem is simply that the domestic revenue of low income countries generally represents about 15 to 17 percent of G GDP. And uh, so 20% of 15% and 20% of 15% is 3%, not 4%, 5% or 6%, it's only 3%. You would actually have to be raising more like 30%, um, uh, you'd have to be allocating more like 30% of your government budget to reach the 6% of GDP, given a typical developing country, low income developing country, um, uh, tax collection ratio to GDP. So the problem is big, um, 
very difficult to solve and only leads in one direction, which is fiscal reform, which would uh, create a sufficient re revenue stream to finance domestically uh, the kind of goals that people are committed to. The third point, which is related, of course, is that aid just cannot and will not fill that gap. And even if it could fill that gap, it should not, at least not over the indefinite period into the future. The purpose of aid is to accelerate development, not to create dependence. About 20 countries have been receiving more than 40% of their GDP in external financing flows for more than 30 years. Continuing that in the short term may sound like an imperative if conditions on the ground are warranted, but in the long term, a different solution has to be found. Aid has plateaued, as we know, and the doubling or tripling that would be required simply will not happen. Fourth, there is a small industry around imagining alternative ways of financing mass public education systems. But there is a problem with this. It's never going to be large enough or indeed dependable enough to generate the kind of flow of resources that would be needed to support the public good aspects of a you know, uh, education system which provides universal access from K to 12 and allows higher education to be financed. The private sector in many low-income countries is only perhaps 20% of the economy and might even be less than that. There's a limit to the resources which it could provide and indeed there's a very big question mark about whether there is the wish to provide those resources. The private sector has not been noticeably generous in publicly and in financing public goods in low income and low middle income countries in the past. Indeed, the problem is rather the other way around, since by some estimates, more than $50 billion a year is going missing through various kinds of corruption, transfer pricing and tax avoidance, uh, which, which diminish the domestic revenue that could be used to support public services. So although one should welcome, of course, uh, real philanthropy, one should welcome private sector organisations that choose to return something to the societies which their labour force uh, inhabit and to promote corporate responsibility that provides public goods. I think one has to be realistic about the extent to which this will happen and will ge and generate solutions to the problems identified in the WDR 2018. Fifth, the WDR argues that there is a learning trap. There is a sense in which some countries, indeed a good number of low and low middle income countries, are stuck in a low income, a low learning trap where learning levels have reached a certain level but are not improving. And that without some kind of drastic intervention, they will remain in the same condition. I'm not sure this is true because we don't really have longitudinal data on learning. I suspect that if we did, we would find that the proportion of the population who are acquiring basic skills is much larger than it was in 1990 and certainly in 1960. So my view is, no, there isn't necessarily a trap, but it's an interesting proposition to demonstrate whether or not uh, it, ca it can be shown to exist. Certainly in the high performing countries, the trap didn't stop them becoming high performing. And that raises a number of questions about and why that might be if a trap does exist. But what evidence there is does suggest there's another kind of trap. And that kind of trap is about the allocation of public resources to education. Uh, but according to Philip Coombs, in the 1950s, uh, the average allocation of GDP to education was around about two and a half percent in low income countries. By uh, the early uh, mid 1970s, that had reached around 4%. But since the 1970s, if you look at the UIS data, uh, you will see that that number has got pretty much stuck around 4%. Between 4 and 4.5% four and has been the average allocation of GDP in low income countries to education. Why is that? Well, maybe it's got something to do with their demography, the ratio of children to taxpayers. 
maybe it's got something to do with the the, the uh, extent to which governments are prepared to raise revenue. As I said uh, earlier in this comment, uh, the average is between 15 and 17 percent of GDP uh, of domestic revenue raised to finance public services. Uh, in rich countries, of course, that number is more like 40 percent, which creates a hugely different pattern of investment opportunities in education. So uh, there is a kind of equilibrium, but I'm not sure it's one of a learning trap. I think it may be one of a financing trap, whereas it where it's proved very difficult for low income countries to shift the needle on the proportion of GDP and the percent of government budget that they allocate to education. Six, of course, we do need better indicators of effort before we start using these figures on GDP allocation to education and so on as tranche release points for aid for all sorts of reasons. But one of the most obvious reasons is that the quickest way to increase the proportion of GDP that you spend on education is to have a recession. This sounds very strange, but it's true. It's exactly what happened in the UK in uh, 2008 to 2010. We appear to have increased a uh, proportion of GDP spent on education from about 4.5 to I think 5.8%. We didn't do anything of the sort. What happened was that our GDP dec decreased as a result of the financial crisis. GDP is much more volatile, can be much more volatile than educational spending in uh, national currency uh, because of the obvious sense in which much of that expenditure is pre-committed to salaries. It's not a very good indicator, certainly not over the short term. Uh, it's not really an indicator of anything unless you know what's happening to all the component parts. The last point I want to make though about financing is that there's some very good news around. The very good news is that uh, in the 1980s, Africa received twice as much uh, for, in external finance than it generated itself from domestic revenue. Uh, by tw 2010, I think these figures had reversed completely and the total volume of external assistance was less than half of the domestic revenue being raised in Africa. This means that more and more countries are becoming fiscal states. This is very important. If a dozen or so uh, of the low-income African countries are now able to finance public services from their own resources, then it transforms the nature of the political debate and the professional debate about what to provide to whom and how. It becomes a question of domestic politics as to what should be allocated to primary, secondary, non-formal education, literacy and everything else. And that's perhaps how it should be, especially if you take seriously the ambition of the SDGs to encourage countries to interpret them at national level in ways which maintains the common framework, but creates considerable differences reflecting different national aspirations, ambitions and educational traditions. So there is good news and of course there is a lot more money around than there used to be and particularly in uh, pension funds and um, in philanthropy uh, 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 around about 20 uh, individuals in Africa had net assets over a hundred billion dollars and ten percent of that would go a long way in the short term to creating educational opportunity for those to whom it's currently denied. And we know, as I also mentioned earlier, that around $50 billion appears to go missing from tax which is not collected, tax which is avoided, and criminal activity related to drugs and other illegal transactions, uh, money laundering of different kinds and so on. All these things need to be addressed. But there is good news. More and more countries are in a position to address it themselves and therefore the need for aid should in fact diminish, not increase. And we have to ask ourselves why it is that year on year we seem to believe that more and more educational aid is needed when if we were successful in accelerating development, uh, the opposite would be true. That the need for educational aid would diminish over time. This is a challenge for all those who work in the development business. I'll finish just by reading the last, uh, last paragraph of my blog. Um, and see if that leaves some food for thought. I say that tax not aid is the dominant source of finance already in most countries, 
and this will be even more so in 2030. If there is a learning crisis, it will be located and resolved within the political economies and national curricula of governments accountable to their own taxpayers for investing fairly and effectively. The only sustainable solutions are going to be domestically driven, and that's where the emphasis must lie. Achieving substantial increases in educational access and quality, leading to greater learning achievement, the sustainable requires serious fiscal reform, much more effective revenue collection and awareness of the cost of learning. These things should all be a major focus of external assistance to education, otherwise learning gains will not be sustained. The World Bank is really good at financing, but not necessarily good at learning. It should be good at developing sustainable systems of finance for learning. The World Development Report needs to explain how this can happen in much more detail. Then it won't be necessary for a, a latter day Phil Coombs to write another book about the global education crisis in 2030. Thank you for your time.